Welcome to Lunch with Tech Leaders, where we have engaging conversations about software development and cloud engineering with industry leaders and subject matter experts. These episodes are created by the Great Lakes Tech Leaders, an online community of technology practitioners. Please come join the conversation by visiting gltl.rbn.ai. Again, that's gltl.rbn.ai. Now strap in, because we're deploying to production in three, two, one. Now recording. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody to Out to Launch with Tech Leaders. Um, we are here today to talk about our delivery teams taking ownership of their infrastructure as code. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce my co-hosts. Uh, beneath me, I've got Tom Kowalski. Tom, say hi. Howdy. I'm to the uh, to the right on my screen, but but yeah, I'm Tom Kowalski. I've uh, been in tech for you know 15 years now, and dabbled in a lot of things, and um, very interested in the delivery teams and uh, you know owning the uh, their products, solutions, uh, customer value. Um, including the infrastructure as code uh, end to end. So excited to talk about this. Yeah. And my other co-host uh, is going to be Ray Welker. Ray, say hello. Hey there. Uh, yeah, I'm Ray Welker. I'm a cloud solutions engineer at RBN. Uh, I do a lot of the writing of infrastructure as code and uh, um, DevOps pipeline, so on and so forth. So a lot of the impl implementation and consulting. And uh, we've got a couple. Uh, GLT mail community members with us today. Uh, David, you want to say hello? Yeah, sure. Might as well turn on my camera. I shaved today, so. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> uh, I'm Dave. That's my first time on one of these things. Uh, infrastructure as code is actually new to me, so you guys will be training me. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> and uh, John, I haven't, I don't think we've met, but nice to see you here. Feel free to say hello and we'll get this conversation going. Yeah. Hey guys, my name is John. I work at Benzinga downtown. I'm a product uh, development manager there, a lot of development, just kind of curious. I actually ran into, I wish I remember his name. I don't think he's here um, at DevFest last week. And yeah, he told, or Derek. a couple weeks ago. And he told, yeah, Derek. And he told me about this. So yeah, yeah. listen in and hear what you guys have to say, what you guys are doing. Yeah, Derek's great for sure. It's too bad he's not here. <laughs> he usually pops in a little late. So, um, our last episode, we kind of talked about comparing Terraform to, C to Amazon CDK. And those are two, you know, popular infrastructure as code tools, and a lot of the conversation led to what we're going to talk about today, which is like, you know, who's who should be writing the infrastructure as code, um, who um, is responsible for maintaining it. You know, I think um, when you look at the DevOps movement in general, I th from what I've seen is like. A lot of organizations are drinking the DevOps Kool-Aid, but then they're not really practicing it. Um, and things tend to be really siloed. And, and you know, there's still like a small group of people that are, you know, the the wizards of Oz who understand how to do this sort of thing. So um, I'll just kind of open it up. Maybe, maybe Tom, you want to throw out some thoughts? Um, I've got a lot of questions I can ask, but just want to see what where your thoughts are on this topic. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, it kind of ties in the DevOps and the infrastructure as code. You know, they kind of came around at the same time. Um, you know, Amazon introducing the uh, cloud formation was kind of like the, the first iteration of it, um, which, yeah, and DevOps kind of started around the same time. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if want to jump right into it, but, you know, I think it was, um, who put that? Jordan put that article out there that was really good. Uh, and, you know, it kind of, Kind of it depends, right? The old consultant architect answer, right, to everything, and uh, I, I I agree with it, right? It co really comes down to where your organization is, right, in the the maturity level of the or the different parts of your organization, um, you know, and who should be handling the infrastructure as code. Um, yeah, and the article kind of breaks it down to where, yeah, if you have a a smaller team and um, you know they they have they have that maturity right the um 
the organization is set up to give them that you know freedom and responsibility model, um, then it kind of makes sense to you know have it very distributed right amongst the teams. Um, but but ultimately, yeah. for me, yeah, I don't want to. Somebody else can jump in, but I have a lot to say about it. I could talk all yeah. the whole time. Well, I think you know you're you're. What we like to see is a stream aligned team, right? That's an independent autonomous team that's, you know, they're empowered to build and deliver the application from start to finish, right? The stream yes. aligned team, right? Um, and that's, you know, common in a lot of small software companies, startups, right? There's only so many people. So everyone's got, you know, that, that small team is responsible. Um, I think when you get into bigger organizations or organizations that have been around for decades, you see a lot of the, like the the breakup between development and ops and QA and product and marketing, right? It's just not, they're just not set up. Or, so I think the conversation needs to start around like the team topologies and the team structure, right? And, um, you know, I think, like I said, you know, companies just like, oh, we need to hire a DevOps engineer so that we can do DevOps, right? They don't, and they don't, ha they don't kind of take a step back and see like, well, how are we organized? Like, what is the topology? Yeah. Because, you know, there's solutions, even if you are that kind of older um, legacy style structure, like you can still figure out a topology strategy that allows you to get closer to a DevOps type of um, environment, right? So, That's yeah. Um, that, a lot of that comes from like management, right? You know, the man, management needs to have a, a strong grasp of the technology that they have at hand and know how to uh, organize a team to, you know, build it to be successful um, within this agile approach. Um, that's something I don't find nearly as common as like I, I, would, I would hope. Um, <laughs> I, I do sometimes feel like management is uh, disconnected from, from technology, from, the, from their tech teams. Yeah, it obviously depends on the type of organization, but right. Yeah, right. I mean, I can certainly say that my previous CEOs were kind of DevOps was just a buzzword, right? A synergy word. Yeah. They had no idea what it what it means, and you know, um, they just knew we had DevOps engineers on staff, and so they assumed we were a DevOps shop, right? So, um, so Ray, you know, you've probably been with the most variety of like customers out in the wild there like what is the most what's the most common scenario you see is it like customer you you know clients are just getting started with infrastructure as code and you have to write it or like they're already somewhat yeah. down, down the path kind of like what are you seeing out there i i've seen a mixture of both um uh, i feel like well with, with as I've been with writing. I, I would say my favorite customers that I've worked with are generally those that are in the greenfield development area. So they they allow for us to um, kind of really take hold of the architecture. Um, we don't have a lot. They don't have maybe a lot of processes in place currently, and we try to provide them um, a solution that is well architected um, and secure, and so on and so forth. Um, I would say those are my favorite, but. Uh, that's mostly because we're then able to be those um, centers that we're, we're we're able to act as a center of excellence and uh, transfer that transfer that knowledge over to uh, maybe a team who doesn't you know currently have some bad practices in place. Uh, we're able to kind of give them a good a good foothold going forward. Um, but like I said, I've seen I've seen both, and um, there there's you know it, it's difficult to navigate um, pre existing um you know uh organizations that have silos in place and or or delivery teams um you kind of have to uh you have to navigate them carefully um so as we come in with as consultants um we need to identify who those key people are um so we we kind of learn our boundaries and what we're able to touch um we may have an opinion on how a certain process needs to be done maybe something needs to be would be better implemented if uh, development hours were spent on the application to do uh, some sort of process, but maybe the ask is that we need to uh, do this in a certain way that is maybe more of a uh, infrastructure as code um, or 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 something that maybe reinforces some sort of bad habit uh, within the code. But that's um, that that's kind of a different topic. But um, we we are kind of able to sometimes go in and. Uh, 
navigate that in you know two different ways. Um, generally, what I see is teams that are already versed with some sort of infrastructure as code tool. Um, so we kind of have to adapt. Uh, that can be a challenge in itself. Um, but but yeah, I guess uh, do you have like a more uh, direct question that I can maybe better better lend towards? Um, no, I, I think it's good insight. Like it's kind of yeah. it's like there's kind of two flavors. Like you said, there's Greenfield, and then there's kind of companies that have already kind of set in their ways, right? And it's right. all it's going to be more challenging to get people that are set in their ways to to change their approach, um, which um, kind of leans into like there's some organizations where it's like just because of the you know, it could be security posture, compliance posture, um, that only certain people are allowed to touch the stuff, right? Like, mm -hmm. so it's it's not even like feasible to have every every developer or every every Scrum team, delivery team, you know, write in the infrastructure's code because of some kind of compliance that requires only, um, you know, people that separation of duties is kind of what I'm getting at. So, you know, there's things like that out there, which is something that was highlighted in, in that article that you referenced earlier, Tom, right? So it's sometimes, you know, because of the regulations or the compliance reasons, only the people can do the work that needs to be done. Yeah, and it's uh, it got kind of blurred, right, with like old, um, you know, adhering to compliances when you're dealing with hardware versus the infrastructure as code where it's kind of like well this you know should be separated where it really doesn't make sense now and the lines get really blurred especially when you're doing stuff like um serverless like serverless framework or like some of the other low no code solutions right there is no infrastructure so um so yeah it is it is interesting but and, and, and like i was saying it kind of brings back like a, the old mentality well yeah it should be separation here but all of there's a lot of modern tech companies right that are that are moving fast that have one team and um like to get around that right and that meets compliance it's usually two people have to turn the key right so yeah it could be one yeah. team that owns the end to end but you know it requires you know two uh two approvals to be merged in things like that yeah so. i know we we have someone on a current assignment who like they were Working as like a, um, working on like more of the infrastructure side of things for this particular client, you know, writing the Terraform scripts, but the client needed them to take on more development work, so they had to like, in order to facilitate that, like this person is no longer allowed to touch the the Terraform and can only work on the development side because of like their compliance reasons. And like maybe, you know, maybe, but it, like you said, it could be like just an old guard mentality. Yeah. Or they're like maybe they just haven't uh, updated their policies to allow more flexibility. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll just like run through the factors that were. Um, I don't know how to say the guy's name, but that article, that great article. But like the the other thing is like the engineering capability. Like if you don't have people on the engineering team on that delivery team who can actually write the infrastructure's code, you know, that's like a that's a limitation there, right? Like, is it are we ex are we expecting every developer to like know all the nuances of writing infrastructure as code and in terraform or cdk like that's a lot right i mean i think to me it's like yeah it's part of your job like you should know how you should know how your application runs in the wild right like you should be familiar with your kubernetes cluster or or your aws auto scaling group but um i do speaking from our time at daysmart tom like you just like i don't think any uh well i mean we had mixed results, right? Like some yeah. teams were willing to take on the development of the infrastructure's code, especially when it came to the serverless stuff, right? Because it's more, I think it's more natural for a developer to go right into serverless applications versus like trying to spin up VPCs and, um, you know, all these other things. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it comes down to like the culture, right? Like at DaySmart, it kind of got mixed, right? Depends on who, you know, who was, in there and what teams were working on it um but yeah then the other thing that it comes down to is the um the ownership right of it <laughs> and again with the culture but if the certain team owns it right end to end it do they don't have to implement 
everything, right? They don't have to implement the infrastructure as code or, or things like that, but they do have to treat it as they own it and they're contracting it out, I like to say, to another team. Um, so they do need to at least speak the language and know, uh, you know, what that team is doing, right? And but still have that ownership of it. And and the other thing too, um, without kind of forgot it. It'll come yeah, back it'll to come you. Back to yeah, but I think it speaks to getting to more of a you know we tried to build out a platform team at Daysmart, right? And I think we missed the mark in that like we didn't actually have internal services ready to consume by the delivery yes. team, right? That we just is, said that is it. We, we just said, hey, we're the platform team. Tell us what you need. And it then... needs to be self-service, right? That that's what you're doing. The enablement. Yeah. Right? You can have another team working on it. Um, but when that scrum team, right? If you're practicing scrum, when that sprint starts, they need to have everything to deliver value on their team at that time, right? They can't be dependent on another team. So you either have to have that you know it's self-service once they begin you need to have people that know how to consume the the different pieces that maybe a, a platform team or operations team has made um or you need to be able to to implement it yourself right? yeah yeah and that kind of gets back to the the topologies of of how um companies do devops we, we touched on the streamline team there's the platform team which basically enables that stream aligned team to deliver work with substantial autonomy. Um, there's another one uh, touched on called complicated subsystem team. So there could be a component of your of your application that is so complicated that you have like a special team that just manages that. Um, but the other one that was in the article that I thought was interesting was the enabling team. So it's a, it's a team composed of specialists that help bridge the gap, you know, that skill gap that the delivery team might have to help enable them to. So when I see yeah, when that, I wrote about the cool. enabling team, it seemed like that's kind of more what we were trying to do at DaySmart was like help enable teams because we didn't, you know, I think we, we didn't really have like a platform ready for, for teams to consume, right? We didn't say, hey, this is our, these are our, these are our products. You know, you can do. You got T-shirt A, A, B, or C, and you know, we didn't really present it that way to the developers. It was kind of like, hell, we'll we'll, en we'll help enable you to do what what you want to do. Yeah, again, I think it was the maturity of each team, right, and the, the culture. Um, yeah. Um. So Ray, when you're out there with customers, uh, clients, do you? I'm sure you see all sorts of flavors. Do you see? I mean, do you see things, do you feel like you see more of the stream aligned teams? Do you see centralized platform teams? Do you see? I feel you know? as if I've seen more centralized teams and uh, a lot more siloed off is what I would say. Uh, there are mm -hmm. teams, they, they may have tools in place to break down these silos, but I oftentimes find that they're maybe not utilizing their ability to communicate uh, changes from, you know, the dev to the dev team to SREs. So there's like a break in terms of what's needed from the actual application and um, what's out there in infrastructure versus like the release team. Um, maybe maybe the release team isn't fully up to date with, um, you know, knowing what's being released. So like there's still like key components that each team um, I feel like is may they're maybe not communicating in in the best way to each other um and i and i feel like there's some dysfunction out there um I, I i'm being vague i would say because i feel like i'm I'm under a lot of nda so i can't really mention clients and things like that so right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we understand sorry we understand. For, for being vague in a lot of this but uh but i can attest to that dysfunction yeah <laughs> yeah i mean um without having to give any you know proprietary information john is can you is can, are you able to share like how teams are structured in an organization that you might be familiar with? Yeah, so um, at Benzinga is an interesting company because you know we're we're a media company, so tech is in, in, like just like this. It's almost like a secondary thing. Like it's important, and we have a lot of like tech stuff that's that's vital to what we do. But like we're at more than eighty percent of our company is writers, so. Mm -hmm. You know the things that we do is it's kind of like chaotic a lot of times like a lot of times we bring people in they'll be 
you know, they have a very specific skill set. Like they're they're like a product builder. They they build these things. They're not necessarily like DevOps engineers that are going through and building these like massively scalable systems. And so we have to deal with those scalable systems at the same time. We have these engineers that come in that don't have that type of experience, but they just want to move fast. So we have a lot of issues with at small dev. We don't even really have a DevOps team. We have one DevOps guy, and then we have a number of people organization that do backend related things that do DevOps out of necessity. And so it's it's just a lot of um, so, dysfunction. So when you when you say that, what what do they do? What is their DevOps responsibilities? Is it a cultural transformation thing, or are they writing pipelines? Um, there's definitely a lot of like pipe CI/CD stuff that people do. Um, but I guess it's it's more of like I don't, from I guess I'll tell you from my perspective is like when I came on like I I was always just like a product builder never never really like building super scalable systems never did serverless I just booted up EC2 servers manually installed stuff never did infrastructure as code mm-hmm. and then you know I have a team you know they, we when I joined then yeah we had infrastructure as code but I'm just booting up basic services so I go to my tool. I use for Laravel Forge. I boot up an EC2 server. It has everything I need installed on it. There's nothing I need to do from a, um, like a DevOps perspective. It's all just works for me. It works for the solution that I use. But mm-hmm. then, you know, there's a push. There is issues with scale in that, right? Like the, there is, there's tools in, that for Laravel Forge provides that I could learn and use to leverage serverless infrastructure and Maybe I could have gone that route, but my organization is not that. Like they, they're already leveraging um, infrastructure as code for a number of other different services outside of what that ecosystem provides. Like we use Go, Python, all these different like languages, and so we already have a team and some knowledge base built. But people like me come in. And I'm just trying to get shit done, so I use what I use, and then I try to work with other people to get things done in different ways. And I'll build up these services, but it's it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard a challenge. to like actually make it work. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like your your organization needs to kind of have that discussion about like what is our topo- what is our team topology and how do we make this work? You know, yeah. it, whether it's a centralized DevOps team, platform team, or you know, you have um streamlined teams that kind of build it their DIY all these solutions. Uh what were you gonna yeah. say, Ray? Oh, I was just gonna find. I was just gonna mention, and and maybe this is a topic for a little later. But it's like, wh- which which approach is better? Like, it, I mean, it, it kind of depends, right? I, I think we talked about that in the beginning. It really depends if you know we should have these streamlined teams or centralized teams. And it really seems like it it, it depends based on the organization's goal. Um, you know, may, maybe it makes sense to be slightly dysfunctional because you know we're we're fo- we're focused on our time to market so we're just rapidly producing yeah. things um well i like what adam said yeah. um like focusing on enablement like i don't know maybe like a like a team enablement's interesting like an entire team to focus on enablement but like me as an individual that's what i try to do all the time like i'm still helping people change their passwords I'm like i need to find somebody else that can do this and help yeah. with their permission management of mm-hmm. our cmss it's like i need to Enabling other people at all levels to me is like the thing, thing that I need to that I that our organization that I need to focus on. Yeah, and I, I give Tom a lot of credit. Uh, we worked together at a previous company, DaySmart, and just yeah, cr- formulating a team that their sole purpose is to help enablement and try to you know get teams aligned, try to provide some kind of you know recommended tools, recommended standards like that that really helps, especially if those delivery teams are receptive to it. They're like, "Oh wow, we've got this team that's a resource that we can reach out to and you know um help us plan what we want to do, help us architect it, help us implement it and you know um send them on their way." So that, it worked out it had its pros and cons, but I think you know it it for the most part it was it was good. That's like the yeah. center of excellence is right. You know, those are kind of those champions of success that kind of bridge the gaps between teams. And, you know, uh, well, I guess the example is if, you know, somebody comes in and provides a new solution um, or like a new tool, you know, you, you need somebody there to help adopt. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's the biggest challenge is the 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 mindset, right? The, the cultural side of it, right? Somebody's used to, I just write code, right? <sighs> Versus, you know, owning, you know, a, a solution end to end, right? Owning that customer value, 
and, and everything that that comes around, along with that uh was, yeah. uh was hard it's kind of like the same could be said about qa right when it comes to like you know qa shouldn't be handed off to some other team to deal with right it should just be part of it, that and it could be right and so this is where i i i think there is one standard that could fit for all you know organizations whether they're big or small and you just have to have that ownership right and it doesn't matter how your company is organized if you do have qa whatever infrastructure but you have to treat it as one team that does own it right end to end and is contracting it out and it's clearly defined responsibilities right like it like it's another company right like aws is my operations team Right. And there's clear boundaries of what they say, you know, what they do and and where my responsibilities are. And right. And and they have to meet certain SLAs and and things like that. And you got to treat it just like, you know, if you do have an operations team, it's like another company that you're, you know, running this for me and you have clear SLAs and, you know, what you're doing or, you know, we need uh, help. But you need to that team needs to own it. Right. The problem fails or the, the issues come up where it's like, that's not my job, right? And it's like nobody owns it, and you ask like, "Well, who's responsible for this end to end?" And it ends up just being the CEO, and that's where it kind of like isn't uh, isn't manageable, right? It needs to be broken down where individual teams, whether you're small or big, right, are owning the uh, the customer value and whatever resources assets uh, that go along with it. Yeah, that's, that's my crazy. take on that. That's definitely something I don't see enough in the wild is clear definition of, you know, responsibilities and teams that own certain aspects. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. Yeah. yeah Trans- usually like things just kind of really get, big. they get either the decisions not made or they just get bubbled up to like a person that doesn't have time to deal with those, those, that level of detail on the decisions. Right. Yeah. Like T- typically there's one person that does know it, right. There's a person who does know how these things operate and will have some ownership, but. I think like that usually bogs down that one that one individual because um, things kind of boil yeah. up to that person because it's not clearly defined. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge fan of how uh, GitLab operates, and uh, the, the beauty of it is that they try to make everything public unless it's like illegal for them, so you can see exactly how their company runs, how um, you know that that uh, directly responsible individual i think they call it dry um and how they do that right and how everyone is assigned that and they can make those um decisions right they do have that autonomy to uh to do that yeah i think we've kind of we tried it all right tom we tried the grass grassroots movement for devops we had some success there we tried to get high level buy-in had some limited success there it's like it's just like at some point, though, it's just like you reach a level of kind of we got to a certain point and then we just couldn't get it quite over over the hump. Right. Or and I, I'm not sure yeah, why yeah. Look, in hindsight, it's like, well, what, what 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 was the what was the real blocker there? In hindsight, I feel it's, uh, you know, you need you. The grassroots is good. Right. And the, you know, coming from the bottom up. But you need that culture set from the top to you know allow that and enable that and i think that's kind of where we struggled right and yeah different management techniques uh you know in, in cycling through different executives and things so that that's where i feel it kind of fell short there but then it's like and, and, we, and we were in a so- software company which is you know by nature technical um when john has to deal uh you know with a media company um like trying to get them to to buy in on DevOps culture. I mean, it's like, you might as well be speaking Swahili to them, right? Like, uh, yes. so I think it's, it's, it's challenging everywhere. And I think that's why, um, you know, um, answering the question of who should own the infrastructure as code is challenging. Um, who should be doing it is challenging because it really does depend on all those factors we've talked about in this talk here, so. Um, great conversation today, everybody. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Ray, you'd like to share or Tom or John? Crickets. Yeah, I think it just takes, it takes time and experimentation to find a good example. I mean, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think you, anybody can do it right the first time. So uh, that's why it's, you know, clumsy and you have to navigate these types of questions. Um, it just kind of comes from experience, right? 
Yeah. I'd like to say, like, the, yeah, whatever is the right path. The one thing that definitely helps is the the, the transparency, the, the communication, right? Knowing who's responsible for what, things like that. That um, you, you can't go wrong with that, no matter which way you take. So, yeah. I yeah, 100%, 100% agree on the communication, Tom. I guess my, my thing always is just based on the nature of how I approach working at Benzinga is I try not to hit a nail with a sledgehammer. So just kind of realizing the tools I need at the time to get the thing done is just like, I guess, one part of the challenge. Yeah. Um, Keep it simple. Tom, you, uh, you brought back some memories of uh, some high load I used to have on a, it was a transactional based company, uh, credit card transactions. So think of 300 some odd clients hitting a load balancer with three web servers hitting a PHP app, right? And uh, in our MySQL instance, right, we, at the time we had, and this was 10 years ago, we had a, a primary master and a slave for like reports. And, you know, it was, it was before all the cloud, but you, you were mentioning, you know, dealing with AWS as a, uh, as your infrastructure provider. I mean, how, I just haven't, been in a situation maintaining an application with high volume dealing with gcp or aws what is it like today versus you know this this data pipe company got bought out by rackspace so at the time it was like you know before the cloud really hit i mean what what's it like when when something's gone wrong and <laughs> in my world you know thousands of dollars are lost every minute that the server is just spinning <laughs> and you know. Yeah, for in, in my experience, it's been amazing, right? There are some times, like when S3 went down, like whatever, like eight years ago or whatever, and it, it brought us down for a good six hours. And there was nothing we could do. Um, but the other times, right? Because Adam and I, we used to run servers in the closet, maintained them, and then co-location, uh, and then moving it to AWS. And yeah, I I would never go back to uh, to, to maintain all of that myself. That's, that's my experience. Yeah, I mean, you get self-healing environments. You know, you can you can build for failure. Um, so things, even when things are faulting, you know, you can a lot of most most everything is either high ava highly available or self-healing if you set it up with a little bit of effort. So um, yeah, the benefits of the cloud have greatly outweighed the you know what I saw with managing your own hardware. I think there's you know, I've I've talked to people who think you know you can save money running your own hardware, and but I mean, to me, it's always like, eh, you know, <laughs> there's like, like a SQL Server, right? With RDS, like, yeah, I don't miss managing my own SQL Server cluster. Yeah, I will say AWS as a whole, it's uh, you you can still do it wrong if you if you really want to. You still have to know, <laughs> you know, you you have to you have to make that conscious decision that I want to, you know. Uh, use RDS for my database, and I don't want to throw it on EC2, or I want to, you know, write it in a way that I have a DR strategy, so everything's, you know, available as much as possible. But uh, yeah, they they give you more tools at your disposal to to do things right. Yeah, that could be a good uh, talk talk for future podcasts. Kind of like you know the benefits of the cloud versus you know um, running your own data center. But anyway, the cost. <laughs> I think because you know I like just uh, build versus buy. You know, Amazon charge up the wazoo, and G GCP charges like crazy compared to what it used to be on these, you know, dedicated servers. Yeah, can add up real quick. Um, want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, thanks again for joining the Out to Lunch with Tech Leaders. Um, everyone uh, my co-host tom and ray thanks for thanks for helping me out here great talk uh next week we're going to kick off a series related to site reliability engineering with uh a github sre kyle robertson so uh please join and uh let's have another great conversation take care everyone bye thanks guys. Right. thank you thanks,